Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to day 90 of the McShane Reading Plan. 90 days. We've been at this every 90 days, so thank you for being with us today. It really means a lot, and thank you for the likes and the shares and the and the comments. That really means a lot. It really means a lot, and um, I hope that uh, the ones you're sharing it with are are getting a lot out of it as well. This is not just a um, an edification uh, exercise for uh, Christians. This is I've also geared it to be an evangelistic tool. Um, if you haven't noticed, um, just like a good Bible message from the pulpit, I try to tie everything back um, in some sense to the gospel. And guess what? It's not really that hard to do because the whole scripture is about Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture is about, so that we would know Jesus Christ. Um, I continue, that's probably why some of the Apocrypha isn't in the canon, like First and Second Maccabees. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that the canon of scripture has to do with the bloodline, uh, the promise and the bloodline and the coming and, and the second coming of Jesus Christ um, and how we can be reconciled to God through him. God the Son. Uh, but today we are, just a second, we are in Leviticus 2 and 3, John 21, Proverbs 18, and Colossians 1. Five chapters today. Um, hit Proverbs 18 real quick first. Um, The verse 8, um, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. belly. Um, tattletailing is not a, uh, is not a virtuous activity. Um, it's one thing to give a report for the sake of, of um, justice and, and righteousness, um, for the sake of God or for the sake of the body, but if um, it's insane, it's insinuating that this is a tattletale, uh, someone who is telling on somebody else for the sake of their own glorification to make themselves look better. Um, tattletales are not um, are not honorable, and a tattletaling is not an honorable uh, business, nor is gossip. Uh, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth to, into it and is safe. And the rich man's wealth is his strong city. And as in high wall, his own conceit. Uh, and rich man to wealth, uh, educated man to knowledge. Uh, um, take your pick. Um, whatever characteristic of label of sin, of identity and sin and the subsequent shield or uh, fortress of it. Basically, if the Lord is, <clears throat> if the Lord is at the center of your life, if you are trusting in the Lord, then He is your strong tower. If you're trusting in something else, that will be your strong tower. Now, no strong tower or, or wall is as strong as the Lord, certainly. But we fortify ourselves in whatever ideology we have. There is nobody. I repeat, nobody that really believes that everything is valid and exists. Nobody. Uh, the people that drive around with exist, uh, coexist bumper stickers, they don't believe in the real coexistence of all belief systems. Why? Try going up to them and saying, well, Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. They will not look at you and say, that's great. I'm glad I affirm that. No, they will either hostily or try to be um, nice about it, but they will disagree with you vehemently. Okay, so it's um, the devil. The devil will get along with his own ideologies, and I'm not trying to uh, throw stones at people. We need to love people. Again, verse 24: A man that has friends must show himself friendly. We got to be friendly with people, not with. We don't need to be friendly with the devil or with sinful uh, doctrine, but we need to be friendly to people. But the point is, is that whatever you put in the place of God in your life is going to be your strong tower. 
could be riches, could be position, could be sex and lust, um, could be any number of things. Could be your hobbies, could be golf, could be fishing. Doesn't mean those things are sinful, but it's like whatever you focus your attention on is going to become your high tower. And um, high towers, strong cities and high towers can't coexist. There is no coexisting in the heart. Either Christ is on the throne or he's not. There's no coexistence. Um, if Christ is not at the center, he's not where he should be. That doesn't mean that if you don't have Christ in the center of your life or in the center of your priorities that you're unsaved necessarily. But if we are saved, we should be wanting to get him there. Um, verse 19, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like bars of a castle. Um, so far, I, I, I want to tread lightly here. I <laughs> don't want to offend anyone. Um, all of us are able to be offended. It, I can be offended. You can be offended. Um, so making fun of people who can become offended is to invite offense. Uh, when we poke fun or belittle or, or get all haughty, it's like, well, I would never do that. I don't get offended. Oh, really? I think sometimes the devil takes that as a challenge. Uh, let him who think he standeth take heed lest he fall. So um, I understand the sentiment of um, not wanting to um, kowtow to people who complain or whine about getting offended on, on certain things, certainly. Um, I believe that people need to grow a spine. Uh, they're going to have a rough time of it if not. But at the same time, we shouldn't want to arbitrarily try to offend people. And so so oftentimes the people who make fun of other people for getting offended are the first ones to get offended in their own right um, for other reasons. Uh, people who make other people out, make fun of other people for being victims sometimes are the ones who become, who put themselves in the position of being a victim themselves one way or another. Um, it's unbecoming. We are not victims. We're victors. Um, we don't have to complain about how the world treats us um, because Christ has overcome the world. Um, now, are there things that we shouldn't stand for? Absolutely. Um, we shouldn't uh, stand for the slaughter of innocents. We shouldn't stand for... Um, uh, immorality and and hatred and and bigotry and racism and all this sort of thing the the name of our god being drugged through the mud or people being uh, trafficked in uh, in in a modern sh slave trade like sl sex slave trade certainly we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't go in for fornication immorality all of these things we should uh, believe in uh, freedom and liberty but here's the thing. When things go sour, we need to remember who's on the throne and behave with decorum, orderliness, and not panic or being offended. Um, it's very important that we act like children of the kingdom of, of God rather than uh, fighting fire with fire. Um, kindness. Again, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. I, for one, believe that you really can convince somebody uh, uh, through your actions and bring them into the fold, so to speak, uh, influence them to answer the call of the Holy Spirit in a positive light. Um, now, that is between them and God, but if we are offensive in how we give the gospel unnecessarily, I'm not saying sugarcoat the truth, I'm saying, say it in love, not in hatred. You don't preach hell like you want people to go there. You don't um, um, preach about sin acting like you want people to be your enemies and you want them to continue to believe uh, a wrong thing because you want to beat them over the head and make an example of them. No, our, our desire for the conviction of hearts is not conviction unto punishment. Our desire is conviction unto them coming to redemption. Uh, we should not... Um, be crying out for justice. Why? <laughs> and I, I hate to say this. Yeah. 
justice. <clears throat> Let me say this. We should be slow about crying out for justice because if we got what we justly deserve, we would all be burning in hell. Okay. So be careful about crying for justice. I'm not saying that, you know, if somebody's, um, somebody runs into your car with their car and, uh, kills a loved one and destroys your car that you shouldn't seek justice or it's not their fault. Excuse me. But I guess I should say we should not seek revenge and we should remember that our just reward, uh, for anything that we have done accidental or otherwise is, um, is the wages of sin is death. We are in a cursed world and we have a cursed dwelling upon us and we need the Lord more than anything. And we need to show him to other people and we need to show him that and show them the Lord in a friendly and loving manner. Um, let's see, how do we go? I'm trying to get back here. Okay, here we go. Um, Leviticus 2 and 3 more it shows how bloody and how meticulous the the levitical sacrificial system was um this is not in in um operation and anybody who thinks that you need to keep the law of moses today that's part of the law of moses um that's not in effect so who defines what parts of the law we keep and, and what is not in effect today, Christ and the apostles. Um, so we have a better sacrifice today than all of this. This is, we need to look at these type of passages and thank the Lord that we don't have to go through this, that he became our sacrifice. In fact, our sacrifice is God himself. Praise be his name. In John 21, he shows up to cook breakfast for the disciples after his resurrection and restores Peter. Would he have restored Judas if Judas had not took it, taken his own life? One has to wonder. One has to wonder. But he restores Peter after his denial. He restores Peter. Ask him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And then Peter <laughs> turns the attention to John and says, what, what's this guy going to do? Folks, again, tail bearers, uh, comp, com, comparing ourselves to one another. Um, we need to focus on Jesus Christ, him crucified and him resurrected. That should be our our aim and our focus it's telling me my battery's about dead i don't know what's going on so we'll just try to cut it off here pretty soon colossians 1 is a precious chapter the one who met them on the banks of the on the banks of the galilee is the is the image of the invisible god that paul talks about in colossians 1 and verse 27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the, all of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in us. So this one who was on the banks of Galilee, who bore our sin in his body on the tree, is God Almighty. He is the image of the invisible God. And he dwells in the heart of the believer. Again, I say, I don't want to point fingers and name names, but anybody who says that you shouldn't ask Jesus to live in your heart hasn't read these scriptures. We need to beg Christ to dwell in our heart, ask forgiveness and trust in his gospel. We don't get there by reciting things as a group of people and hoping that it sticks on some if it's not going to stick on all. We have to have an individual relationship with Christ. It doesn't mean that we can't praise him together and by reciting things, but folks, it's you can't just expect people not to respond to the gospel individually and expect there to be a change take place. There has to be repentance. There has to be um there has to be a turning away and there has to be faith. 
There has to be faith. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith is not a work, but we must have it. It's not wrong to ask Christ to dwell in you. It's my prayer he dwells within you today. We love you. Have a good day.